There we go. Okay, I really like this paper uh, today. I thought it was, I was pleasantly surprised. It was easy to read and it was. What? Uh, really? <laughs> what, dude? It, was, it was numbers and letters. <laughs> well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll help explain it. Um, let's see, hang on. So, so the discussion is about Rickettsia peacockii versus Rickettsia. Rickettsii. Okay. And the first author of the paper is Rod Felsheim. What year is this? 2001. So it's a little bit older, but I knew Rod. It, he was at University of Minnesota. He was like, um, a, he, I, I, he, he was kind of like a mentor for me. So I, I was actually, I was glad to read a paper from him that I thought was, I thought it was quite good. Um, and he's, he was uh, in Uli Munderloh's lab and um, also in conjunction with Tim Curry's lab. They, they do research on rickettsia, Lyme disease, tick-borne diseases, things like that. And they do tick cell cultures. Okay, so, so what was the point of like the study? Why study this? Because they saw that um, our rickettsia was um, less virulent in the presence of tick is that the right way to say it? So you're saying our uh, it, it reduced the prevalence is what they Yeah, said. reduce the prevalence. So recall, remember yeah, at the no, last that's very, I get what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So so recall, remember from the last lecture, there's this place in Montana called the Bitterroot Valley. There's a Bitterroot River, and there was something on the west side, something on the east side. And on the west side, you would get tick-borne illnesses and you would die. And that was traced to rickettsia, rickettsia, and the illnesses. The re, there was reduced prevalence, was what you said. Reduced prevalence on the east side, and later this paper is now sequencing the genome of quote unquote the east side agent, the east side agent, and um, the hypothesis was that there the east side agent was essentially either. Um, what was the word? I think they use interference. Interfering, or you could call this potentially like competition for the niche, um, or these are probably the two best words. And actually what the, what the hypothesis specifically was, was that because the ticks on this side in, in their ovaries um, are already this like symbiont, Rickettsia picacchia, picacchia that that one is sort of like excluding Rickettsia rickettsii from getting sort of like established in these ticks or um, it's reducing the vector competence of those ticks for that disease. So that would explain the reduced incidence of the disease. But it's wrong to say reduced virulence because this thing is right. still virulent. Sure. Um, why out, so, so yes, this is sort of like, it, that's why this is a really fascinating study to try to figure out um, historically like putting some clues together as to what was the what was really the answer behind this um, phenomena why else would you want to understand this like why else would you would you want to like do this study besides from like knowing or solving this like disease conundrum if there's some homology in other organisms possibly that would connect the dots if there was homology then what then if you learned a lot about this you could apply it to that um, if you're reducing prevalence of like a virulent agent, um, so maybe so I'm, I'm like trying the mechanism to, thereof. Yeah. Okay. So so how about um, mechanisms of virulence? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like that's a huge area of research in microbiology. Is if you have a disease pathogen. What are the genes in the, that organism that actually cause like the pathogenesis? And why does it make people sick? And if you can understand those mechanisms, then, then what might you be able to do? Yeah, like you could make, if you understand those mechanisms, maybe you could develop a drug that would block something, or maybe you could, um, yeah, exploit them. Like figure out what's going on and figure out how to stop it. Um, other things. So we already said kind of like the history, like I'm kind of like listening, like what are all the reasons why this study is useful? 
Any other thoughts? I did under I, I did put that down. So mechanisms, uh, mechanisms of symbiosis. So understanding essentially like how a pathogen might eventually become a symbiont, and and that we'll talk more about like that was actually their direct rationale is that the Pacaceae probably like descended from Rickettsii and is now has become a symbiont. So there's sort of some basic biology here and understanding like how symbiosis happens. What else? There's a few other things. Uh, in reference to the transposon, it's a mechanism of genetic manipulation. So it can be used as a tool if understood correctly. So transformation, although, um, tra so I'm thinking of like, like a toolkit transformation, like a biotechnology transformation toolkit. I think more probably closer on that line, um, certainly that would be important. So maybe like- um, You can do like knockout. Okay, so so a transposon essentially like, but I think the sort of the broader thing for that is sort of like understanding mechanisms of genome evolution. So like, what causes genomes to evolve? What are the actual like molecular biology like things that cause genomes to shuffle around and evolve? And then the transposons are a part of that, and they could be used as a tool for sure. Um, is there anything that I'm? There's one thing that that um, that people have not mentioned, which is mechanisms of attenuation, which is what? Lessening the, yeah. That would be lessening virulence. Oh yeah, we did say that. But that, I guess, I guess what I want you to take That's home is the, I mean, what I want yeah. you to take home is the actual word. Right, right. Yeah, but no, That's you're not oh. all of it, I meant prior to that, yeah. Well, these would be a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. Because this is sort of like, although they're definitely gonna be linked because like how it's causing pathogenesis, if those things mutate, then you would get attenuation. So yes, I think these two are like linked. They're essentially the same thing. Okay, so this is all why you would um, study this. So just just other side notes. Um, I I just think comparative genomics is like really fun with microbes because microbes are small enough genomes, or it, they're just above viruses in the sense that like, there's just enough complexity where you in theory could probably understand the whole system. So how many genes about are in these organisms? Or did anybody catch when they sequenced the genome, how big the genome was? It was 1.2 megabase pairs. That's 1.2 million bases. Okay, now somebody else, is that big or small? It's small. Yeah, so this is, these are small, these are small genomes. They have about, you know, about like 1200 ORFs. And so like these microbes that we're working with, they have, this is actually called, it's not, it's not only small, it's a, this is a reduced genome. So that means they actually have less genes than like a bacteria that lives outside. And so in that sense, they're kind of some of the most simple bacterial organisms and 1,200 ORFs is actually like a small enough number that you could, if you wanted to understand the system, you could feasibly actually like memorize 1,200 genes and what they do. Nobody would do that, except maybe me, but um, like you could feasibly do that. And so it's, it's sort of like a simple enough system that you could, in theory, understand the whole thing. Can you remind me what an ORF is, please? Yes, good question. ORF is what? Open reading open reading frame that's essentially like the molecular biology term for a gene oh, okay. an open reading frame starts with an atg oh, okay. so goes so to a stop codon okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. and this encodes for a protein that whole thing would be considered a word. that's an open, open reading frame yes okay. and just remember that so 1.2 megabase pairs that's not all orfs there are some intergenic sequences sure. non-coding dna although Probably in this reduced genome, it probably is largely all the orbs. Okay, uh, anything I missed? Uh, the plasmid. Yes. Oh, that was the, that was the that was that was actually the fifth, the sixth thing of like why you would study the system is plasmid biology. 
plasmin, like understanding plasmids is super important for microbiology and super important for pathogenesis and super important for essentially anything that deals with microbes. Why? Why are plasmids unique? We all know what plasmids are, right? They can transfer information. Yes, that's how bacteria like communicate and transfer and acquire new genetic content. And for in many cases, the, the things that cause virulence like pathogenesis are on plasmids. And so they get passed around a lot and they evolve a lot. And um, we're essentially like, I, I have this saying that like whatever is on plasmids is often like the most interesting genes from that organism. Because they're the genes that like do stuff aside from like the housekeeping things that you need to stay alive. So plasmid biology is really important. Um, and there was a plasmid that they discovered. Okay, let's see. Um, just a couple reviews for everybody. So the Arpacacchiae, um, what is the host of Arpacacchiae? The dog. Dermacenter Andersoni. Okay, so that's the host, and that's also the vector of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Rickettsia rickettsii. Uh, we already went over the map, and we already went over the theoretical hypothesis. So what did they do? What was done in the study? Destroyed with the bacteria and passage that in cells, like the cells. Like what cells were they growing it in? So, so, so remember back, so let me just pause that for a second, that's correct. Remember, the trick of these things is they're very hard to culture because they're obligate intracellulars. It's not easy to culture these things. So how did they culture them? Yes, so, so that's the other cool thing about this study. They're growing them in what are called ISC6 cells. These are tick cells. So there's only like a few tick cell lines and that's what Tim Curdy is like, um, that's like his specialty. And that's like this lab's, one of this lab's sort of specialty and Uli works a lot with tick cells. So it's cool in a sense of like, there's not too many labs that grow tick cells and they're growing rickettsia inside of tick cells. So they're actually growing the bacteria in the I don't think they're from dermacenter, they're from Ixodes, but they're at least like growing them in the same cellular system um, in the sense that they're growing them in ticks. So that's cool, and then what did they do? Then they extract the DNA and sequence Yeah, then you just sequence the genome. So how did they sequence it? What was the, did you catch what the technology was? I think it was 454. It was 454. So you won't need to necessarily know what that is, but it's, it's essentially like, it's an, I think it's actually now outdated. It's an older version of next generation sequencing, but it's a way to get sequence, to get a whole bunch of sequences for a reasonable cost. And I, like, I'm not a sequencing guy, so I think people mostly don't do 454 anymore, but at one point that was like the standard. Um, so they do this 454 sequencing, then what happens next? Assembly. assembly. So how do you assemble? Did I already talk about this? You put it in a computer algorithm, but how does the computer algorithm know like where to put stuff? Contigs. Yeah, so so you get what are called scaffolds or contigs or like reads. Your reads will go for some distance of base pairs, and your hope is that your reads overlap, and then a computer algorithm can find this and find this and align it together. Oh, we did talk about this in the context of the male locus, which was hard to assemble in the mosquito because there was lots of repetitive DNA. So anyway, they do this, it's a lot easier for, to do for a bacterial genome because it's only 1.2 megabase pairs. Genomes of like mosquitoes are like, like way better than that. So it's, it's way easier to do for bacteria. Anyway, so they do that, they assemble it. And then actually they did one final thing. Um, what do you do, what do you do if, so say you, say you align your contigs and you produce sort of like larger contigs so say you had like three big scaffolds. How do they actually like connect it into a chromosome? Not all of these overlap. And so that is, that is sometimes a problem is you get say a few distinct scaffolds. How do you connect to them? Because what what's the structure of typical bacterial chromosomes? It's tip, so in bacteria, most, chrom most bacterial chromosomes, they typically will have like one chromosome and it's a circle. So, so they, these should all like link together. So how do you, if you have a problem where you can't, you can't link them, how do you link them? 
What did they do? PCR. Yeah, you just do a PCR. So you would design a primer here, and you would design a primer here, and you kind of have a guesstimate that these primers might be together. You mix them together, and you see if you get a PCR band, and if you can amplify between these, then you can assemble, you can like figure out the gaps. Does that make sense? So that's what they did before. Nowadays, you probably do something like long read, like you could do long read sequencing. Like now the new age sequencing can get longer reads. So this is, I think, less of a problem nowadays. But back then, you might have to do a few PCRs to sort of like get the final assembly on the final chromosome. Okay, so they assemble the chromosome of Rickettiopithecus. Then what do they do? Yes, they annotate it. Okay, so you run it through an algorithm. So you have just sort of like a .txt file, which has your sequence of your genome, and you run it through an algorithm, and guess how the algorithm, what is it annotating? I heard a few different things say it louder. Yeah, it's annotating the ORFs. So there's that word again, or the genes. How does it find the ORF? What will it look for? So it will look for ATGs. The algorithm will look for ATG sequences, which is the only star codon. And then how does it know if it's an ORF? That's after. Or there's normally like other sequences involved with like the mark genes. But say, say, okay, say you saw something like this. So um, um, I don't like you're gonna have like you're gonna have some. I don't want to give the answer away, but you're gonna have some long sequence, right? How do you know when the ORF ends? That's not that okay. So what are the so it'll find either a TGA, a TAA or a TAG, and then this may or may not be an ORF. How do you know if it may or may not be an ORF? It makes an uh, even number of amino acids, I guess. Or so now you're getting closer to the right track. Like, then you map out, like, what is the number of amino acids from here to here? Okay, so say, so say from this start codon, this theoretical start codon, to the next stop codon, let's say it was, three amino acids long. Is that an ORF? No. Let's say it was 15 amino acids long. Is that an ORF? Uh, maybe. Yeah, you don't really know. So what, what, what point do you think you know it's an ORF? There's a functional domain that's picked up by the Hang on, that's after. Like, do you see the conundrum? Like at some point, it either is an ORF or it's not an ORF. And there's kind of like this gray area. Um, if it was a thousand amino acids long, would you, do you know that that's an ORF? Why are you shaking your head? Um, because the polymerase protein for viruses is like up to seven or nine thousand. So. Oh, so that's not divisible. What do you mean? But that is an ORF. Well, yeah, but I mean, I would expect it to be a little bigger than a thousand. A thousand amino acids—a big protein. What's the average amino acid side for like the average protein? This is actually an interesting question for some biochemistry. Like probably, I don't know, probably, I, I actually don't know, but probably the average size of a, of a protein is probably like 30 kilodaltons, which is maybe, I'm guessing, which is maybe like, maybe like 300 to 400 amino acids long. Like that's probably, probably around like the average size of a typical protein. And so if it's longer, do you know it's an ORF? Okay, yeah, my bad. I got nucleus bags mixed up with the amino acids for yeah. a second. Okay, but so wait, if it's a thousand amino acids, do you know it's an ORF? No. I think you do, because think, how do you know it's an ORF? I assume it was multiple of that size. Multiple? You can have you can definitely have proteins that are a thousand amino acids long. That's not like too large. I'm trying to get you to understand essentially like they probably had a manual to figure these things, just like look at it. Well, okay, hang on, but you don't look at it. A computer program looks at it. And so you have to tell the computer program how to know if it's an ORF. 
And so I'm trying to oh, like teach you. Well, it will do that, but that's later. I'm trying. So okay, okay, my point is, you know for a fact if it's a thousand amino acids long, you know it's an ORF for a fact. How do you know it's an ORF? Why? It's continuous. Yes. So what should you see if it's not an ORF? You'll see random stop codon. So if it was not an ORF, you would see like a stop codon here or a stop codon here. Nothing based on probability of like just randomly stringing sequences together. You will never get an open reading frame that long, ever, based on probability. So if you see anything that's sort of like over, probably over like 100 amino acids, the odds of sort of generating a random DNA sequence with no stop codons, 100 amino acids long, is almost like next to impossible. So you know that anything sort of like over a certain cutoff threshold is in fact an ORF, okay? So you'll set like, you'll set, you'll tell the annotator in the algorithm what's sort of like the minimum ORF that you want to identify. And let's say you set it at like 100 might be a little bit too, too like too large. Like you, you, maybe you set it at like something like 50 to 75. I don't actually know. But you tell the algorithm, okay, anything that's above 50 amino acids long, then you do step two, which is, guess what? You blast that sequence, and then the annotator will blast that sequence, and if it matches anything, then you're pretty sure it's an ORF, and then it will annotate it automatically by bringing that information in and sort of like tagging it like in the code. Okay, so that's how actually like genomes get annotated. So they do that, then what do they do? Then what's the next step? Looking for similarities between the... How do you do that? That's correct. So similarity between, or actually like, are you looking for similarity or difference? You're probably looking for both. Like you're gonna do a comparison. So you're gonna compare that genome of Picacchii versus Rickettsii. And how do they do that? Like what, so there's this first figure that's like this weird, thing that looks like this, okay? And these all have different colors, so I should be drawing this with like some different colors. You see this figure one that looks like this, and there's some arrows, and the arrows point at like these spots, and then you see these lines that look like this. What does this mean? But what are these blocks? Those are ORFs. Are they ORFs? What are what are these multicolored blocks in Figure One? They're 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 what they call syntenic regions. What is a syntenic region? Has to do with the location of the genes, or location of, yeah. The location, genes. but more specifically, the order of genes. So for example, if you have in a bacterial chromosome, say within this block, you have four genes. These are all distinct genes that code for different proteins. Let's say it codes for A, B, C, D, okay? And you find a sequence somewhere else in a different genome that codes for homologs in the exact same order, A, B, C, D you would conclude that like these probably descended from a common ancestor because what are the odds that you have the same genes in the same order? That's next to impossible. And so the ancestry of these sequences is from like a common ancestor, okay? And so what they're mapping is these syntenic regions. So these blocks are not ORFs. The blocks are contain multiple ORFs that are syntenic. And it says, okay, we're gonna call this region, like let's call this region blue region. And in Rickettsia Rickettsii, it's in this spot, but in Rickettsia Picacchii, it's in this spot. And then let's say this sequence here, we'll call this the red block. Here in Rickettsia Rickettsii, it follows the blue block, but in Rickettsia Picacchii, it's over here. Okay, so what's the what's actually like happening here yes it's like essentially like scrambling like imagine you have like a deck of cards 
and then you like shuffle the deck of cards. That's literally what's happening. Okay, and so what are the, every, in the figure they're marking these arrows, what are the arrows? So the arrows are transposons, which I'm gonna talk more about in a second. Um, actually, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. I'm thinking how, so essentially, what, what is the importance of the transposons before I explain them more? True, that's true. Transposons are jumping genes and they can, they can cause sections to jump. But are transposons like popping this giant region out of multiple genes and moving this over here? Is that what's happening? No, they're causing bone strength breaks, which causes the transposons. Yeah, so, so actually what they're mapping out are like recombination events. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain this in a second. But again, just the best analogy is like, the transposons are inducing a, a mechanism that's very similar to like shuffling a deck of cards. Okay, so keep this in mind. Um, and let's talk for a second about the transposons and then I'll explain more like transposon biology. Um, okay, what was, this trans, what was this transposon that they're marking? What's its name? Kyle. I, oh, I'm sorry, that's the family. That's, it's ISRA1, I think. I wrote R, ISRP1. What's IS, Kyle? The insertion sequence. So er, transposons get names that are called like insertion sequence. It's called insertion sequence because it inserts its sequence. So this is a transposon. Uh, how many copies of it were there? 42. 42. Technically, actually 40, but two of them were inactive, like truncated, mutated. Is that a lot or a little? That's a lot. That's a lot. Why would a bacteria have like 42 copies of the same gene? Maybe early into it. Does it? That's a really interesting question. Do you think bacteria need transposons? Or are the transposons bad for the bacteria? They're so sort of parasitic. Yes, they're parasitic DNA. You're, you do not want to have like active transposons in, in your body or in your chromosomes. Why? It messed you up. Yeah, it'll, like, look what it did to the Rickettsia peacockii genome. Although in that case, maybe it actually helped. Yeah. It like stimulated evolution and maybe became more symbiotic. But like, you do not want active transposons in your germline because they do that. They'll shuffle your DNA. And if your DNA gets shuffled, like you die, typically. That's typically what happens. So. The other reason it's odd is because, again, remember, are these genomes small or large? Small. small. So do you think they carry around like extra DNA? No, so it's kind of odd to see anything with high copy number in these bacteria. That, that means like there's something special going on here, for sure. So that was the first thing that sort of like they pulled out. How would they have found this? Like the, just the, it's a very simple test or experiment in a sense of like, how do you figure out that there's 42 copies of this one gene? So if they have the genome, if they have the genome, you would pick out. So, so I'm trying to think of like how you to explain how you would actually do this experiment. So you have the genome of Rickettsia peacockii. If you want to check copy number of all the genes, you would systematically take each of the ORFs that was annotated and blast it against itself. And then, if you got 42 aligned regions, that means you have 42 copies of it. Does that make sense if people understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yes or no? Okay, so so if you have, like I, I want people to understand this actually because I want them to understand what's happening. If you have a chromosome, let's say it starts here to here. Just imagine your chromosome is filled with different genes. One, two, three, four, two, and. Okay. And let's say number one is a unique gene. So you pull out, in the computer, you pull out the sequence of gene one, and you blast it against the Rickettsia peacockii genome. So you're saying, you tell the computer algorithm, find this sequence in this chromosome. And how many times is it gonna find a replicate of this precise sequence, according to this diagram? Just one. Just one. Now imagine if the genome had something like this. Now you do it. How many times is it gonna find a copy of it? One, two, three, four, five. 
and then you would conclude there are five copies of this gene in the genome. So they did this and they found 42 copies. And I'm saying that's odd, that's not normal. Uh, it's not normal to have 42 copies of the same gene. That means it's parasitic DNA. Um, there, that also tells you a few things about the transposon. So what does it, Kyle, what does it tell you about the transposon if there's 42 copies of it? It's a high copy transposon. What is it, well, yes, yeah, so what, what, what does that imply about its functionality? It's most likely copy and paste. So it's, it's replicating no. itself. No, it doesn't imply that. What does having a lot of copies imply about the transposon? When you look at a transposon in a genome, what do you typically see? Well, what you see is like a lot of times it's flanking. Like it's flanking. Okay, when you find a transposon, nine times out of ten in a genome, what do you notice about that transposon? Oh, it's dead. It's dead. Yeah. So most transposons that you see. It's really concerning. When I say quote unquote dead, what is it for just everybody, for everybody's benefit? What does it mean to be a dead gene? Non functional. It's non functional. It acquired some mutation and it's no longer like translatable. So it's a pseudo gene. It used to be a gene and it died. When you look at transposons, most of the time, nine out of 10 are dead. Why are most transposons dead? But why are they acquiring these mutations? Like, why don't they save themselves? Because they jump around a lot and it's not very efficient. Like, things get cut off when they copy. Yes. So, so they jump around. That's exactly right. They jump around a lot and oftentimes they, like, acquire mutations. Also, too, is there any, like, what, if you have, say, gene X, if you have gene X in some organism, what keeps that gene X from mutating? It's selected for. So if you break gene X and gene X is essential for life, you die. So that's called purifying selection. So if you look at normal like housekeeping genes that are beneficial for the biology of the organism, they're not dead. They're alive. They're normal functional genes because if you lose them, you die. That's purifying selection. So when you look at transposons, does purifying selection operate on transposons? No. Why? Yes. So that's why most of the time when you see a transposon, it's dead. What if you see 42 copies of a transposon? It means it's good for the... It's probably like, quote unquote, alive. Like I'm using like live and dead. Those are bad terms. I know Doc Martin would be upset at me for that. Um, but like it, if you see 42 copies, it's probably like an active, quote unquote, alive transposon that is actively, it's orifice functional, it's probably being trans, translated, and it's probably jumping. Um, okay. Where did the transposon come from? No. Nope. It came from a different bacteria. What was the bacteria? Cardinium. Cardinium. So cardinium is a fascinating bacteria. It's also an endosymbiont and it also causes CI. And so this is another bacteria that you see often co-infected with Wolbachia or co-infected with Rickettsia. And so what does this tell you that you see a gene that's from cardinium in Rickettsia peacockii? Because some might lateral transfer Yes, so there's lateral transfer. So these two bacteria are sort of like talking to each other in evolutionary history, where there's some context, either in a tick or whatever, some insect or some arthropod, that sometimes they sporadically have co-infections where some a Rickettsia and a cardinium will be in the same host, and then genes get passed back and forth. That's lateral gene transfer, or another word for this is horizontal gene transfer. That's when genes transfer between organisms. Okay, and transposons are famous for this. So this is interesting because it tells you, again, like this paper tells you not only the differences between this and this, but it tells you what Rickettsia picacchia is sort of like, like, again, bad analogy, but it tells you like what its close microbial friends are. Its close microbial friends are Cardinium and uh, Pseudomonas, which we'll talk about um, later when we talk about the plasma. Okay, so a little bit more on transposons. How much time do I have left? 15. Oh my gosh, okay. I gotta do this fast. Um, okay, so I still, wanna, I still wanna leave this up here. So, okay, so let me just quickly explain how transposons work. I know this is review for Kyle, but I don't think it's review for anybody else. Okay, so a transposon is an enzyme 
Enzymes are uh, proteins that do stuff in cells. Okay, and a transposase encodes um, nuclease activity. Okay, so a transposon, when it gets translated into or transcribed into messenger RNA and translated into a protein. So let's say here's the T protein. The protein can actually come back to its DNA sequence and it has amino acids that recognize the edges of the gene. So there's these special sequences on the left and the right of the transposon gene. They're called inverted repeats. And the transposase, when it gets made, it will grab onto these things. Okay, so it'll grab them and then it cuts it out. So if this is a genome, this is a longer genome, and this is the transposon gene. It gets made into a protein, it grabs itself, and it cuts itself out. So that produces a thing that looks like this, okay? This is what's left with here is a double-stranded break. What happens typically when you have double-stranded break, remembering like the CRISPR lectures? Yeah, like, like there's repair pathways that go on. Also, like you get weird things that happen like recombinations and stuff like that. So it's essentially causing double-stranded breaks, okay? But then this thing also, um, or actually, is it a double-stranded break when it excises? It is a double-stranded break, so it doesn't just like evenly come out? It's a, it's a whole break. Okay, cool. Fact check me on that, but I'm glad you fact checked me on that. Um, okay, so once it pops out, so transposons have different categories. So Kyle said there's, there's copy paste, there's cut and paste. Which one is this transposon? Cut and copy. It, it's not a copy, it's a cut and paste. They, well, there's not a whole lot of research. The only, the only, the only copy paste ones have a reverse transcriptase. Mm -hmm. Copy paste transposons have a reverse transcriptase. This does not have that. So it's a cut and paste. So here's a conundrum that you should be able to kind of like, I can teach you as a molecular biologist. If it's cut and paste, how do you get 42 copies? Because cut and paste just cuts and moves it. So how do you end up with 42 copies? Explain that to me. During replication. If it jumps during replication, that's a good, so this is a very good example of how you could get to, okay, there's a few different mechanisms, this is one. So imagine you have a bacterial cell it starts replicating its DNA. Imagine it replicates the transposon over here, and this is the old copy over here, okay? And then imagine during replication, this thing jumps, and it jumps to the new daughter cell, and then these things divide through binary fission. This one ends up with two, and this one ends up with none. This can create a situation where you start to get like differences in copy number. That's one mechanism. What is another mechanism? Yes, okay, so remember, they discovered a plasmid in this bacteria. So there's a chromosome, here's a bacteria, there's a chromosome, and there's also a plasmid, which is like a tiny chromosome, okay? Plasmids can have multiple copies. So there's high copy plasmids that can have up to like 600 copies of themselves in a cell. I don't know how many copies they said this plasmid had, I don't, it's probably not a high copy plasmid, but it probably has more copies than just one. Well, that's how many would jump into it. But my, but essentially my point is plasmids can have different copy numbers. Yeah. Like you might have one chromosome per cell, but you could have 20 copies of a plasmid per cell. And so what happens if a gene, a transposon on a chromosome jumps into a plasmid, now all of a sudden when that plasmid replicates, if you have 20 copies of the plasmid, you have 20 copies of the transposon. Okay, and now these things can jump back and forth from plasmid to plasmid. And so now you can get a situation where this thing's jumping. So what you said is true, it has two copies in the, in the plasmid. So there's a point at which two things jumped into the plasmid. And then if there's multiple copies of this, these things can be jumping back into the chromosome over and over and over and over. And so eventually you get to a situation where you have like a whole bunch of copies. So this is how, this is sort of like a trick of how cut and paste transposons can go from one copy to like 42 copies. Okay, now, to understand like how this happens, okay, so 
when a transpose up, let's sit, now imagine, so again, we now understand how a genome can get multiple copies of a transpose on. Okay, so let's say we have two copies. It's got its inverted repeats, it's got its inverted repeats. Um, now, okay, these two sequences, are they the same or, or different? They're the same. And what can happen with DNA sequences that are the same? They can recombine. So you can, now this, if you have a structure that looks like this, where you've got like a weird loop, it can form a structure that looks like this. Because this DNA is the same sequence as this DNA. So here's the T, here's the T. They can form what's called a holiday junction. They come together. <laughs> Who's that? That's a fun name. Oh, the you never heard that before? No, uh, the holiday junction, okay, if you've never heard that before, a holiday junction, it, it's actually kind of hard to draw, but it, it essentially kind of looks like this. It's where it, the DNA from one strand can invade the other strand because the sequence is matched, and then the DNA from this strand can invade that strand. And then once you have this, that's an induction of recombination. And so once you have this, then you can start swapping stuff. And that's what this is. That's how stuff gets swapped around. And that's why at every single swap site, guess what is right there? The transposon, which means that that's what's happening. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's like what's happening at a molecular biology level to cause the evolution of these things to change. Um, okay, so now we, do we all fully understand figure one? Like that's a pretty simple figure actually, like what's it's explained for? Hopefully, yes? Okay. Um, okay, so how can, they gave two examples of how uh, this can, in, this process can impact virulence. One was in Francisella, and another one is this one in Picacchiae. So in Francisella, in Francisella, what did they say happened? Yeah, so the same process happened in Francisella and it caused higher virulence. So it could make a pathogen worse, but then in this case, what did they say happened? Yeah, in this case, they saw attenuation. So there's like, it could go either way, depending on like how the evolution happens or what is changing. Um, okay. And, sorry, I'm trying to think of what to go to next. Okay, final thing with the transposon. They show like a phylogenetic tree of this transposon sequence. Why do they do that? So there's a tree, I think it's, I don't know what figure it is, but they show a tree and it's a phylogenetic tree of these transposons. Why would you show that? Yes, it shows you where it came from. The thing, whatever, whatever, tell me, tell me the figure. What's it right next to? Cardinium and this environment? Yes. So there's this copy of a transposon, and the thing that it's closest to is the same transposon from Cardinium. That tells you where it came from. It probably came from Cardinium. That's how they know it probably, that's the best hypothesis of where it came from. Does that make sense? because this jump is easier than something from over here. Okay, so that's how they show the tree. Um, how much time do I have left? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, so let's get to the, like, the final conclusions. So, they have this hypothesis of attenuation. What are the things that they think is causing the attenuation? They actually give you like an enumerated list First, like, what is the list constituted of? The PRPRs. What? The RPRs. RP, what's an RPR? Mm -hmm. uh, Rickettsia, plasmid. I don't know, I'm looking at the table, the table one. I don't think that's the list of the things that they're thinking, that's a list of what's on the plasmid. Um, so they sequence the plasmid, yes, and they gave you like a list of stuff that's on the plasmid. But that has nothing necessarily to do with the attenuation hypothesis. I see. They How, what's, their, what's, the, what's in their list of enumerated things that they Mutations. think? What? Mutations. What? 
Mutations. Mutations, okay. So it's a list of mutations, or it's a list of mutant uh, mutations, or actually, it's actually a list of essentially deletions of genes. And a deletion of a gene can mean it either died, it became a pseudogene, or potentially like the sequence is literally like missing, okay? And so through this transposon evolution, and after they compared this genome to that genome, how many of these differences were there? How many? Something about seven? Is that about right? Do you see the table we're looking at? It's a little bit more than seven. Say that one more time, say your question. How many differences are there between Bukakia and Rickettsia? There's literally a table that lists the differences. If it's the if it's the bull region, just yeah, four. There's seven. Oh. What are the seven you're seeing? It's like six zero four seven. They give, don't they give you the names of the genes? Like they actually give you the names of the genes. Nobody caught that. The cell surface. Oh, yeah. that's one. And then like protease two. Okay, so let's list them out. So there's the ink repeat. Oh, I was there's an anchor and repeat domain. There's some gene called DSBA. There's a gene called RICA. There's a gene called Protease 2. There's a gene called OMP A, SCA1, and some complicated phospho. Blah, 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 blah. They literally give you a list and they say these are all the differences between this and this. And essentially, like, that's it. Did everybody see that list? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is literally kind of like they're saying, so if you have any hypothesis about attenuation, where are you gonna look? In, in this, like these are the causes of attenuation. What's their best hit and why? So well, they have a few best hits. In this why. paper, it was Rick A, wasn't it? Rick A was a good one. Why was Rick A a good one? Yes, there, there were previous studies where if you mutated Rick A, the bacteria became non-modal. And remember how I told you Rickettsia actually like swims around in the cytoplasm and it swims with enough force that it can like explode out of cells and invade the next cell? So imagine what happens if you make it non-modal. It can't swim anymore. So does that make it less pathogenic or more pathogenic? Less. So they actually like found that. That's a good candidate. What else are there good candidates and why? SCAL1. SCAL1. I think they did follow up on Scott one, but I didn't actually think, see them talk about it that much in this. It was in another paper. It's in another about paper. Adhesion. Anchorin. Adhesion. They talked mostly about the the anchorin protein. Why do they talk about the anchorin protein? It's it's found to be related to the Rickettsii strain like virulence. So like exactly it, how? Okay. So you caught that? Yes, that's the important point I'm looking for. Specifically, explain to me why the anchorin repeat one is important. No, not, not about the protein. You said you, it had previously been shown in Rickettsia virulence. Oh, are you talking about like it's more repeated in the one? So this one had already been hit before yeah. in a strain of Rickettsia rickettsii called strain Iowa. And did anybody see what was unique about the strain of Rickettsia rickettsii from Iowa? It was attenuated and guess what it had a mutation in? This protein. So this protein has already had like two hits where now this paper and the other paper that this thing causes attenuation. And they found that that was also the case in Picacchii. Okay, so more on, so this protein is like a really good hit. This one was a good hit. I mean, this whole list is a good hit, is, are good hits. But this, these two had already actually been like demonstrated. Um, okay, the final thing about the anchor and repeat, the other, the other reason that people are really interested in the anchor and repeat proteins is because anchor and proteins that's a domain, that's a protein domain from eukaryotes. So eukaryotes, um, again, the cell structures are different and they have different proteins in some sense. The anchor and repeat protein, you typically find that in eukaryotes. So why is it weird to find a, a eukaryotic gene in a bacteria? What do you think it does? It's, uh, it could be like, a, like an identifying protein. Why would it be weird to find a eukaryotic protein in a gene from a bacteria? But why, what because would it be it's useful? It's reversed, it's like, you know, you're going like evolutionarily reverse. 
Yes, that's why it's weird. But what do you think, like, what does that imply that it does? Well, it implies that, okay, so imagine, remember, rickettsia are obligate intracellular. So imagine you have a uke cell and a rickettsia cell, and they make this anchor and repeat protein, which is normally in a eukaryote. What does that imply that the, that protein does? Possibly then become the eukaryotic? No, it probably gets secreted out and then interacts or like hacks the host. Does that make sense? Like if you want to hack into the biology of the eukaryote to be pathogenic, you have to speak its language. Does that make sense? So you make proteins that it knows, like it recognizes them, and then you can sort of like manipulate the system. So there's a term for this, it's called an effector. What is an effector protein? An effector protein is a protein that's made by a pathogen that gets secreted to cause an effect in the host that's beneficial to the pathogen. Does that make sense? So just the structure of this gene implies that it's a quote unquote eukaryotic effector. And they prove it by when Pekakii attenuates it, this gene is what mutates. Does this make sense? Um, any final questions? It was the paper as hard as you thought, or or it was, what was so hard about it? It was a lot of just the language of it. I'm not really? Okay. As an applied entomologist, you don't see a lot of those words. Yeah. But but does this make sense? Yeah, yeah. After you explain it, it does. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but when you have to look up every other word, yeah, then it's hard. Out what you're reading, okay. It's hard. But you're learning a lot then, at least. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I actually really like this paper um, because, I, again, like the final point, final take home is it's actually kind of fascinating to be able to take something that will kill you, something that's immediately related to it but will not kill you, and then compare them and find literally a list of only like seven things that are different, and that means that the difference of killing you and not killing you is <laughs> that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's almost like like the split of a hair of what makes something kill you or not kill you. And I think that's pretty cool. Right. It could actually only be a couple. Right? Yeah, it could, it could in theory be like one of these. Yeah. So yeah, okay, that's the paper. What's the, what's the TRA? Trogy. I had a section on that. So why do people care about trogy? I got two different responses from Google. One was T cell receptor alpha. No, that's wrong. I didn't figure it was. That's or transformation. Yeah, so 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 why why are trogenes important? Trogenes encode conjugation machinery for bacteria. Okay. So the, again, so conjugation machinery is essentially like bacterial sex, and yeah. they form like a little pilus mm -hmm. that spits plasmids back and forth. So the, in bacterial papers, microbiology, you'll see a lot of discussion about trogenes because they mediate the sort of the transfer of plasmids. Okay. Um, but I didn't think they linked any of the tra stuff to pathogenesis. Oh, I, I think they're just talking about it. On there and I wrote it down. Yeah, no, I think that's they're just talking about it because that's something you that's very popular to, or it's very important for bacterial. It's hard uh, for me to pick out the most important bits. No, yeah, yeah, no, I got gotcha, you, I got gotcha. you. Okay, cool, good. The end.